Hello cave dwellers, welcome into the cave. Today's whole video is prompted by one of those late night online auction sessions. You know the ones you put in a bid, you think there's no way I'm ever gonna win this thing. And the next thing you know, you're driving an hour away in your car to pick up something like this and lug it up three flights of stairs. And I don't regret a minute of it. This thing cost me 50 pounds. It's a Bang & Olufsen Bovision or Bo Vision 1. And you would have needed a cool 1800 pounds or thereabouts to buy this thing when it was on sale between 2001 and end of life was about 2006. Why did I want it? Well, aside from the fact that it has a freaking motorized stand, look at it go. That 25 inch screen gives out a crystal clear picture. Honestly, it's one of the best CRTs I've ever looked at. And it supports PAL, NTSC and CCAM signals. So I can plug all sorts of things into this thing. And as well as a fantastic picture, it's got those lovely active speakers tucked away underneath there. So I certainly wouldn't call it compact, but it's a nice all-in-one unit. And I think it sits in this area of the cave nicely. The next question then was, what am I gonna plug into it? What can I enjoy through it? And what can all the guests that walk through the door here get the most out of on this screen? And I quickly decided it would be the N64. 1996 is a Nintendo 64. It's got some classic four player games, GoldenEye, Mario Kart 64, all of that good stuff. So I thought I'd dedicate this corner to it. It soon dawned on me that this was probably the absolute worst choice of console I could have gone with for this TV. The reason being that the N64, it outputs a composite video signal and we had a composite cable as standard when we bought it here in the UK, or you could buy an S video cable, but there's no RGB out. Despite having the same connector as the Super Nintendo that came before it and the GameCube which came long after it, I would have had this composite cable Composite is when the luminance, hue, and saturation are combined into what's called the chrominance, and that gives our display all the color information it needs to give us a picture. It comes out of our RCA connector, generally a yellow one, and we've also got left and right audio. S-video, or separate video, carries individual color and luminance signals, and it comes out of a four-pin mini DIN connector. You generally get a better picture out of S-video than composite, but when you're talking about analog signals, quality of cable, shielding, these are all factors that can affect the eventual image that you see. The next step up again would be an RGB video signal, which has an individual channel for each color, red, green, and blue, and a separate sync signal. Here in Europe, we generally enjoy this through our SCART connector like this. Yes, that's SCART, not a similarly sounding word that I know our American friends like to call it. RGB should give us an even better analog signal than composite or S-video owing to all of the extra bandwidth offered by a separate channel for each color. And it's something that we're used to seeing here in Europe. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that everyone here in the UK used RGB and SCART exclusively for every system we had. We suffered RF, we used composite, we used S-video, but we knew that if our system supported it and if we could get a cable for it, RGB was the top of the tree for us and we would go out and buy that cable. The Mega Drive is another example that we could enjoy RGB signals on quite easily with just the addition of a SCART cable. Which is why it was all a bit odd when the all new N64 came along and RGB was totally absent. Is it such a big deal? Well, if you've got a 14 inch portable television in your bedroom and all the pixels are squashed up, it probably looks good enough. But then this thing came into my life. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna RGB mod our N64 and we're gonna look at the results and we're gonna see if all the effort was worth it or if I just need to choose a different console for this corner of the cave. Let's get the soldering iron and find out. Here's the mod then that we'll be installing. It's by Tim Worthington. It's been around for some time now and we've got some newer firmware on here which will unlock some features. We'll check them out later, but the first job is to get it installed. So over to you, Mark, to do the job. Let's be honest here, opening up an N64 takes ages. It's got outer security screws. And when you finally get the case open, it has a rake of screws just to get to the main PCB. At last though, after removing the massively heat sink shielding, we find what we've been looking for. This console has the DENC version of the encoder chip, which means we have to solder the wires directly to the legs of the chip. Fun times. Taking no risks, we pre-tin our stripped wires. And apply flux to the chip legs that we'll be soldering to. 
My approach here was to tack the two end wires to the chip and once the strip was in place, solder the rest of the wires to their corresponding pins. Slow and steady is the key here though. Once all the joints were made, I checked them for robustness and bridging with the fine tweezers. Then I pop some polyamide tape over the wires before bending the ribbon back on itself as per the install instructions. Connecting to the mod board itself was considerably less fiddly. There are pads for each of the different encoder types so all we needed to do was find the right pads and solder to those. Of course, finishing up with a bit more polyamide tape for a good measure. The N64 RGB is a bypass mod this means that it takes the signals at source on the console and outputs them in a cleaner and more advanced method than the original hardware could. These wires are taking that new signal from the mod board so that we can route it to the Nintendo 64's AV output port. And do I even have to say it? Probably not. The output port on the N64 is easily connected to via these handy pins on the bottom of the board. This makes connecting up the corresponding wires pretty easy. To prevent the wires from moving after soldering, we use some hot glue flattened down into place with some, you guessed it, polyamide tape. This makes for a nice strain relief and also insulates the wires from each other. After digging around on GitHub, I found some information on how to connect the in-game reset and controller functions for the mod. So pads A and M on our mod were connected to pins 16 and 27 on the peripheral interface chip, respectively. It's worth noting that this part of the mod isn't part of the official instructions on the mod designer's site. I think what we're saying here is proceed with caution. With our last two wires installed and everything looking pretty good, it's time to put this 64 back together and see what it can do. Nicely done, Mark. With the installation completed, the question then is, does it make a difference? To answer that, I've captured both the modded and pre-modded N64 using RGB, composite, and I did try S-Video Cable, but we run into some problems, as you'll see. And I focused on the TV, but there is a use case for capturing the N64 for streamers, for example, who want zero latency capture. So we will dip into that too. Let's get right up close to the TV then. I filmed this as best as I can. And this is Pilot Wings on a composite cable. It looks okay. A little bit soft around the edges, I would say, were my first impressions, but it is as I remember it from having an N64 back in the day. There are no real surprises here to me in the image quality. With the RGB mod, however, it's almost like everything comes into focus. I, I wasn't expecting it to be quite so noticeable, I will admit that, and it makes a huge difference. For a clearer comparison, let's split the screen in half. Composite is on the left, RGB is on the right. What about S-Video? I hear you cry. Well, things got a little bit odd with S-Video. I found myself when I used that cable with a very washed out bright picture. 
Now admittedly, this is a new cable that I'd got just for testing, so I can't rule out that there isn't something up with that, but I have read some interesting posts on forums about PAL N64s and S-Video cable issues, so I think it's going to need some digging. And if you can shed any light on that, then your comments would be most welcome. Disappointing, but there's no point sugarcoating it. This was my real world experience of buying a cable, plugging it into the N64 and trying it out. And it was just nasty on the S video. I know it should be better. Anyway, back to the composite. This is Lark, clearly modeled on Mark. And the RGB image will now wipe in from left to right, just so you can see what a difference that it makes. And in case you were in any doubt, let's wipe again from right to left, going from RGB back into that composite image. Let's try capturing now with a game that will be very familiar to plenty of you. Of course, it's The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. So here's our unmodded composite capture. Again, it doesn't look too bad, really. S video continued to be very bright on our capture so we have ruled out that it was the television because it's having the same behavior on the capture card but even with it being bright there are some findings that we can take from this and here's the rgb image now if i just pause the title screen it's quite noticeable not just the clarity of the picture and the depth of the color in the rgb modded version in the middle band but the fuzziness of the composite image on the left and also the S video on the right. Even though our S video is too bright, we can still see that it's a bit fuzzy. The RGB is clearly winning out on the capture card and it looks great on our TV too. The removal of those fuzzy marching ants around the edges and the better color contrast really does lift the whole experience. And no more evident is that fuzzy effect than in Mario Kart 64 around this text on the title screen. On the unmodded console, you can see that it's shimmering. Let's get right up close. Switch to our RGB mod and it's rock solid. This is a night and day example of the effect that I'm highlighting, but once you spot it, you do start to tune into it where it's perhaps more subtle and it's infuriating when you can't unsee it. The mod seems to clear all of that up and your eyes will thank you for it, especially on screens where you're reading text. And away from text, the real gain here is contrast, which gives everything a bit more depth and brings a little bit more clarity to those textures with the RGB mod whether that be a very brown racetrack. Or the white slopes of 1080, where the differences are far more subtle, but they still don't go unnoticed. So it's fair to say that the RGB mod is working out for me, but it does bring a couple of extras to the party. First up, I was really impressed with the quality of the capture from it. If you're a streamer or you just want to capture footage, then yes, it's transformative in the quality that you get out of it. But you may be asking, why don't I just get an HDMI mod for my N64? Because these do exist. And that's an option worth exploring. But if you already have a scaler such as an OSSC or maybe a RetroTINK, then instead of putting another one in your N64 as part of a HDMI mod, then the cheaper RGB mod can give you the same results. This one cost me £40. I know you can get them for about $26 to $30 in the US, so it's not a particularly expensive mod. The RGB mod adds no lag to the output from the console. Of course, your scaler might do that once you put it through there, but if you're playing on a CRT and splitting off of the RGB for capture, then you won't notice that. This is our modded console captured through an OSSC with three times scaling enabled and a little bit more to fill the screen as I've rendered this out. And I think it looks pretty nice. But by holding a combination of Z, Start, R and the left, C left on the joypad, you can disable the N64's blur effect. Here it is on. And off. And if you missed it, here is blur on and we'll sweep across the screen to show it disabled. And now let's freeze it with blur off on the left and blur on on the right. So you can see the word game in the middle there is blurry and the word start is not. 
The mod being able to disable this blur behavior is really nice for those who want to try and capture it. So I think the real benefit is on modern displays, but even on a CRT on some games, it's nice to feel like that Vaseline blur has been wiped away off of the screen. Another option on the mod is 15-bit color mode. This drops the color from 24 to 15-bit internally. The result is less color information, but you've got to look really hard to see it. The gradient in the background of Bond here, for example, loses its smoothness. The gain to be had from doing this is that it frees up more memory. That's perhaps useful for homebrew titles that are aware of this feature, and I don't have a flashcard to really explore that, so if you know of any examples, do let me know. The final soft button that the mod introduces is a reset button on the joypad, so hold down a combination of buttons, the console will soft reset and that will drop you back, perhaps if you have a flashcard to the menu, so you can choose a different game without having to stand up, walk over, I know, a big job, walk all the way over to your console and press the reset button like the lazy sausage that you are. Let's turn that down before we annoy the neighbours downstairs. Now, with regards to the success of this mod, I only have to use my eyes. I think we've ended up with a picture at the end of the day that is far superior to the picture that we started with at the beginning of the day. So I'm really happy with the success of this mod, which surprised me because when I first suggested it on Twitter, I've got an N64, should I RGB mod it? It was met with some skepticism over on Twitter. Uh, a lot of people saying, it's just not worth it. You won't see the difference. And actually you definitely can. I don't know whether it's because of the television that we've got or if other people have tried different mods and they haven't tried this one in particular, I don't know. All I can say is I'm really satisfied with the result and it's well worth it. And I'm also, of course, really satisfied with that television. It looks brilliant with the full controllers up. We just need some seats here or even bean bags so people can come and enjoy it. And uh, I think that is a spot on N64 setup for me. I really like that. All that remains to be said today is please let me have your thoughts and your comments. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. And a huge thank you to Retro Games HQ, which is a shop based in Swindon. Pete there sorted me out with the N64 down here. If you're in the area, do pop in because they've got a huge selection of games and lots of bargains. And if you're on the other side of the planet and you have no idea where Swindon is, I do apologize, but if you're local, uh, Retro Games HQ is well worth a visit. I'll put a link to their shop in the uh, comments down below as well. As always, thank you for watching. Take care and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.